copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police, calling all authorities, attention all authorities, lost Cassidy Levin, regarding the murder of officers Brett and Fester, who were shot to death tonight in Boyle Heights. Suspect of driving a battered old Ford. Description of the only suspect obtainable is a medium height, has thin hair, wearing a checkered suit. Get him, boys. That's all. Go ocean clerk. Average motorist, you buy gasoline for only one or two cars. What would you do if you had to supply thousands of cars with gasoline? You'd check pretty carefully all the different brands. You'd analyze their many claims. And not satisfied with claims, you'd make actual tests yourself to see which gasoline is most powerful, which is the fastest, which gasoline really does give more miles to the gallon. That's how the buyers for large cities like Los Angeles and Oakland select the gasoline for their thousands of police, fire, and emergency cars by actual tests. What gasoline wins these tests? Nearly everyone knows that Rio Grande Cracks gasoline has won them for years and thereby won the contracts to supply gasoline for more police, fire, and emergency cars than any other brand in this market. It is an honor to have the finest, fastest, most powerful motors on the road using your gasoline. Rio Grande is able to hold this leadership only by producing a gasoline which actually outperforms others. No other gasoline can equal this performance because Rio Grande holds the exclusive patent rights to manufacture cracked gasoline by the Sinclair process. Millions of dollars have been invested in special refinery apparatus, which breaks gasoline drops into unbelievably small atoms so they'll burn more efficiently in your car. Rio Grande balances cracked gasoline so it starts quicker than other brands. So it generates more power, so it speeds up faster. And this cracking and balancing ensures that Rio Grande cracks burns evenly and completely. So there's no waste, as in gasoline made by the ordinary refining process. You can actually feel the difference in your own car when you change to Rio Grande cracked gasoline. One tankful will convince you that there's a world of difference. Please try it. Please to present Chief Jane D. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. It is only when a police officer is slain while protecting your life and property that many of you realize how dangerous and at times how thankless his life is. The brutal killing of two men with whom I worked in the first auto patrol in the city of Los Angeles 15 years ago startled me as it did the entire police personnel of the state into such a realization. Tonight's dramatization of that fiendish slaying and the manhunt that followed it will, I sincerely hope, impress upon you the peril in which your police officers work. I hope, too, that it will serve as a warning to those who live outside the law that it is far more dangerous to shoot a policeman and take a chance on getting away than it is to surrender. For although a detective will do his best, no matter what the case is, he will do a little better than his best, go with less sleep than the little he normally gets, follow clue after clue, never giving up when he is searching for the murder of a fellow officer. It is the night of December 6, 1921. In Mosley's auditorium at Grand Avenue and 16th Street, the annual police ball is being held. Clad in severe black and white evening dress, accompanied by their ladies in dazzling colorful gowns, the guardians of the law are at this moment being led by Mayor George E. Cryer in the Grand Mosque. Immediately behind the mayor marches Police Chief Charles E. Jones. Just as the march is drawing to a close, an attendant approaches the chief. Big pardon, Chief. Yes, what is it? Important telephone call, sir. Tell them to wait. They said to get you to the phone at once. It's headquarters. Very well. Will you pardon me, my dear? Always business, you know. Certainly. Go right ahead. Right here. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hello? Chief Jones speaking. What? Yes. 
All right. I'll be right down.
Harry, look. What? Stop the car a minute and turn off the lights. What is it? See those two cars down the street there? Yeah. Oh, I get it. Tire thieves, huh? Well, we'll just take those lads in. Come on. Okay. Turn on your lights like you was going to drive by them. Windshield has a sticker on it, like comes on new windshield. Oh, well, what are it? Hey, what are you driving past for? Aren't you going to pinch him? Nope. I got a hunch of him. What's the matter with you? Listen, I may be crazy, but that was a new windshield in that Ford. This old prospector who saw the shooting said they used an old Ford, and that one of the bullets shattered the windshield. Those guys might be the ones we're looking for. Yeah, they might at that. Well, we're going to follow them and find out. and Raymond tail a suspected car to Hermosa Beach, where it enters a garage behind the house a block from the ocean. The windows of the house are lit up, and the two detectives remain on watch until the lights go out at 4.30. Next morning, they are to stake out early, accompanied by Hitchcock, and their vigil is rewarded when three men and two women come out of the house clad in bathing suits and go down to the beach. Leaving Hickok on watch in front, the two detectives go around to the back door. They enter by means of Raymond's pass key. Say, hey, Harry, here's an ankle. What's that? In this drawer here, look. Revolver. Automatic. And look at this sort of shotgun and all the slugs. Hey, let's get a look at the garage. Okay. Well, there's the old Ford in the garage. Yeah. Now I want to take a look at this windshield. By gosh, Urban, I'm right. What's that? This is a new windshield. Here's the price on this sticker. Say, Harry. Here's the old one here. And it's broken. Where? On this bench. Oh, boy, this is more like it. Hey, what are you fixing in your pocket for? That piece of glass I picked up on the street. Wait a minute. Here it is. Here it is. Now. Now, let's see. Evan, it fits. This is the gang that murdered Bretton Cluster. <laughs> The next day, the three detectives return and watch until the same three men and two women go to the beach for their swim. Then they interview the occupants of the adjoining house. It all depends on what they look like here. Yeah. I'll stall till I find out if it's okay. How do we do, ma'am? Could you tell me who lives next door? I don't know. Why are you asking? Well, we're interested in men. Well, I don't know nothing about them. They just moved in a couple of weeks ago. They keep it themselves, and so do I. Seems like they stay up mighty late, though. I see. So you never met them, then, huh? No. I don't do no visiting with neighbors out here in California. Now, back in Grand Island, Nebraska, where I come from, it was different. Yes, yes, of course. As a matter of fact, ma'am, we're police officers. Police officers? Oh, well, I declare. And we'd like to keep watch on these people next door. Why? What have they done? Well, we don't know, but we're interested in finding out. I wonder if you could let us occupy a room on the side of your house next to theirs. Well, I, I don't know. I'll have to ask Paul. Paul! Oh, Paul! Yes, Henry Eckert? What is it? Well, what's it you want? These men are police officers. Hey? It's the law, Paul. Hey, uh, what the after us for? They ain't, Paul. They want to watch the folks next door. It's all right. Well, I suppose so. Have they shown you the uh, baby? Oh, yes, of course. There you are, sir. Well, <laughs> that looks sure enough like the real thing. <laughs> uh, you can come in. That's fine. Go into the room, Hickok. We've got to plant that machine. Right. simple matter to plant a dictaphone behind a curtain in the house of suspects and run a line over the shifting beach sand to the house next door. All day the detectives lie in hiding, alternately taking turns listening at the dictaphone. Late in the afternoon, the party returns from the beach, and then, as they sit around the dinner table, the detectives get an earful. Hey, get a load of this. Well, let me tell you, guy, you better never doubt Bill's nerve when he's around. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Curly and Bill will be down tonight to talk things over. Ask him about that time in your time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Curly and Bill pulled plenty of fast ones on the Mormons. Oh, come on, boy. Cut the arguing. Have some more potatoes. Sure. Bleach for them. Where's Babs, Marge? She's lying down. She got a headache in the sun today. Hey, here's Curly now. He just let himself in. Hiya, Curly. Hey, Curly. How's the boy? Hello, boy. 
Hiya, Mod. Where's Bill? I couldn't make it so early. You'll be down later. Hey, got some grub for me? Sure, Curly. Here you are. Got any angles, Curly? Yeah, a couple. Hey, and get this, Cal. You know, we got to get busy and get some dough. Oh, sure, that's right. Just as soon as you line up the jobs, we'll pull them. Oh, yeah? Well, we've had some good jobs lined up, and we'd be getting the dough right now if you had any nerves. Yeah. What do you mean I ain't got no nerves? I had plenty the night we bumped off them two coppers over in Boyle Heights, didn't I? Didn't I go to the receiving hospital and make sure them two guys were dead? Didn't I? The rest of you monkeys didn't have them. No doubt about it. Those are the birds that killed Burton Cluster. Come on, let's knock them over right now. Yeah, come on, Harry, let's go. Now, wait a minute. We've got these mugs any time we want to take them. Let's wait until this bill fella comes. Let's get them all at once. Later, Bill, the apparent leader of the mob, arrives, and they discuss a job they have in mind that will net them some Christmas money. When Curly and Bill leave the place, Raymond follows Curly, and Irvin and Hickok tail Bill thus discovering the Los Angeles addresses of both men. The next night, the three detectives decide to arrest the gang, but Jess is missing. They plan to get an early dinner, and hoping Jess will have arrived by the time they get back to knock the place over then. But on their return... Hey, this is funny. Well, what's up? The house is gone. Hmm, do you suppose that, uh... Beg pardon, Constable. Yes? They moved out while you was away. They did? Yes, they all left less than 15 minutes ago. A baggage man came and took their stuff away, and... They all piled into that old fort of theirs. I couldn't stop them. No, no, of course not. Maybe we should have knocked over the six of them while we had a chance. Yeah. But I did find one thing out. <laughs> yes, I got the license number of the car and the name of the express man. Through the quick witted cooperation of the old lady, the detectives are unable to pick up the trail once more. The express man, when questioned, tells him the address on South Hope Street where he transferred the baggage for one of the girls. They raid the girl's room and take her to headquarters. Heedless of her loud protest, they question her half the night. Finally. Now, look here, Marge. It's up to you. You can tell us the truth and save yourself, or you can lie to us, and sure as I'm standing here, you'll hang, just as all the rest of your friends are going to hang. Listen, boys, you got me all wrong. I ain't done a thing. Honest, I ain't. I come from a good family, I do. I'd never harm a living thing, not even a copper. Yeah, we know that, Marge. Now, we're not doubting you. But what we want to know is, what do you know about these other guys? Now, remember, if you want to talk, it'll save your neck. You're innocent. We want to believe you. Well, I guess they bumped off the bulls all right. That's what they claimed, anyway. Who are these guys? Who's Curly? Well, his real name is Willard Thompson. And Bill, who's he? He's Bill Brinkhurst. They both served time up in Utah. Well, what about the rest of them? Jim Wheaton, Cal Rowe, and Jess Wendell are their names. Jim Wheaton, Cal Rowe, and Jess Wendell. Hey, tell me, why did you leave the beach so suddenly? The boys just got a hunt. That's all. Where are they now? I don't know. Honest, I don't. I wish I'd never seen them. I'm straight, I am. I was trained to be a nurse, and if things hadn't been so tough, I'd never taken up with them. Oh, I wish I was dead. I wish I was dead. Through Marge's information, the detectives arrest Bab. Her story agrees with Marge's in every substantial detail. Then the roundup is on in earnest. Curly is the first to be awakened from a sound sleep and placed under arrest. A stakeout of additional detectives is left in Curly Thompson's room, while Raymond, Irvin, and Hickok raid Brinkhurst's dwelling. He, too, is captured before he can shoot. And a short while later, Wheaton is taken as he walks into the trap in Curly's room. Next day, Rowell, too, walks into the arms of the law as they are staked out in Thompson's room. With the entire gang, excepting just Wendell, rounded up, the detectives proceed to question the suspect. Under the grilling, Wheaton and Rowell quickly to confess their participation in the crime, though stoutly maintaining neither had shot the two policemen. Thompson is question next. Uh, listen, you big flatfoot. You're just wasting your time. I won't talk no matter what. Now, look here, Thompson. Remember that time an informer sent you back to the road gang in Utah? Uh, what's that got to do with this rap? Mm, nothing much. You know who squealed on you for a $25 reward? No, and I don't care. Well, maybe you don't care. I'm telling you anyway. It was your pal, Brinkhurst. You're a liar. Oh, I don't think so, Thompson. Here's the reward receipt for $25 paid out to William Brinkhurst. Hello, dear. Why, he was my best friend. Yeah, that looks like it, doesn't it? 
Now will you come clean? No. Just because he was a dirty stool pigeon, you don't you think I'm one? You'll never get nothing out of me. And Curly Thompson stoutly maintains his silence. Brinkhurst is next to be questioned. He claims he was helping his wife with the washing on the night of December 6th. Mrs. Brinkhurst is brought in to face her husband. Mrs. Brinkhurst, your husband tells us that he was helping you do the washing on the night of December the 6th. Is that true? Go ahead, Molly, and tell him about it. That was the night you had such bad rheumatism in your left hand. Remember? No, Bill. It means work this time. I covered you up. I lied for you for the last time. You've got to face it alone now. I've given you the best of myself. I just nothing left now. I'm, I'm burned out, Bill. I'm through protecting you. I'm, I'd like someone to protect me for a change. No, officer. My husband was not home that night. Two days before Christmas, Detective Raymond locates the estranged wife of Jess Wendell the only member of the gang still at liberty. He gives the officer a picture of Wendell and the license number of his Ford Coupe. Raymond returns in high spirits to the officer of Secretary Mitchell of the Auto Club. Mr. Mitchell, I've got a picture and a complete description of the last one of that gang. Good. What do you propose to do? I want to run him down. Well, aren't you satisfied with the four you have? No, sir. I'm going to get every one of those guys that kill my pals. This Wendell is the toughest of the lot. I want to broadside the West with circulars announcing the $10,000 reward offered dead or alive. Go ahead. It's going to cost money to print and mail these flyers. I'll send to an order to advance you whatever funds you need. That's great. After a long search for a printer, Raymond finally finds one willing to undertake such a mammoth order on Christmas Eve. Twenty traffic officers are dispatched from headquarters to augment the clerical staff of the auto club, and the circulars, ink still wet, are in the mail by midnight of Christmas Eve. The day after Christmas, the phone rings on Raymond's desk. Sergeant Raymond speaking. Hold the line a moment, please. Madam California is calling. Hello? Hello? I want to talk to Sergeant Raymond. You are speaking to him? Good. This is Constable Harris. I'm in charge of the road gang near Maryland. I just got your circular today. The man you were on passed through now and day before yesterday. He did? Are you sure? Yeah, he was driving a Ford coupe piled down with bedding. He drove up and asked for something to eat. I told him he'd have to wait until I heard the prisoner. He looked scared. Said he was in a hurry. I was suspicious, so I took down his license number as he drove away. And what was the number? The same as the one on your circular. That's fine, Constable. And thank you for your information. Quite all right, Sergeant. Can I do anything else for you? Nothing right now. If you can, I'll get in touch with you. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now we can start to move. Get me Western Union. Western Union? I want you to take a telegram. To whom the telegram going? To every Western Union office in Southern California, beginning at Maryland and then to Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Hey, Tom, sir, do you know what you're doing? That means thousands of officers. Not in our field. Never mind that. Charge it to the Automobile Club of Southern California. Raymond's request, Santa Fe Railroad dispatchers send Wendell's description to every station on the Santa Fe throughout California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Every brakeman, conductor, porter, engineer, and fireman is furnished with a copy of the message describing Wendell and his automobile. The message which begins one of the widest manhunts in the history of the Southwest. While hundreds of keen-eyed officers in every town and hamlet in three states are searching for the fugitives, word comes from Yuma that a man answering Wendell's description stole a pair of Arizona license plates and is heading east. Then from Oatman, Arizona, comes a flight that Wendell's coupe had passed through that town. Raymond, Irvin, and Hickok, missing the Eastbound Limited, jump in their car and race it to San Bernardino, intending to board it there. Arriving ahead of the train, Raymond telephoned Sheriff Mahoney in Kingman, Arizona. Hello? Hello? Sheriff Mahoney? Yes. Can you speak to I'll try. This is Sergeant Raymond of Los Angeles. Did you get my circular describing Jess Wendell? Yes. Well, this Wendell was last seen heading east through Oatman. 
Detectives Alvin and Hecock and I are taking the 1040 in a couple of minutes, but I'd like you to start after him right away. As the three Los Angeles detectives climb through the Cajon Pass aboard one train, Sheriff Mahoney and his deputy rumble across the desert on another. Seated at a table in the dining car, they scan the highway that parallels the track. Well, we might as well eat while we're working. That's right. Uh, well, where can I get you, gentlemen? Now, uh, let's see. We'll get some of this Virginia ham and sweet potatoes. Yeah, but that, that's mighty good to do, sir. Yeah, sir. Make mine the same. Yeah, sir, I'll get it right away. Not much traffic out in the highway today. No, too cold to drive across the desert this time of year. That's the people traveling by train if this is a sample. Yep. Hey, Mahoney. Look up ahead there. What? That's Black Speck on the road. That might be it. Yeah, might. Well, keep your eyes open. It's, uh, yep, it's the fourth. And it has bedding piled on the back. That's it. Pull that emergency cord. What's <laughs> the idea of pulling a car? Can't stop to explain, conductor. I'm sheriff of this county. Come on, Red, get your gun out. Wait. Car is empty, Dad. As I see specs in hands about it. Right. Hey, buddy. Where's the guy that owns that Ford Coupe? Oh, him? Oh, he come ask for food. I tell him go to the section house. My woman feed him. Well, go in there and tell him to come out with his hands in the air. There is the door, Mahoney. No, he disappeared. Come on, let's take him. Come on, Mahoney. I'm afraid it's too late now. himself off. Look, he only wounded himself with the first shot. Then he had the nerve to pump three more into himself. Hold on, he's moving. Take that gun from him. Don't worry, boy. I'm through bumping off, coppers. <laughs> but the joke's on you, boy. You, you can't hang me now. <laughs> train bringing him back to Los Angeles. Jim Wheaton and Cal Rowell were given life by a jury that took into consideration their confessions. And on April 21st, 1924, Brinkhurst and Thompson were hanged in San Quentin. By agreement among themselves, Raymond, Irvin, and Hickok, whose splendid detective work brought this case to a successful close, split the $10,000 reward and gave one half to the widow of Officer Brett and the other half to the widow of Officer Class. Thank you, Chief David. Police officers realize that their lives are at stake when they speed up their emergency cars to capture a criminal. They can't take chances on ordinary gasoline and risk a stalled engine, a foul spark plug, a sluggish motor. That's why many thousands of operators of emergency cars agree on Rio Grande cracked gasoline and specify it exclusively. Drive your car into your neighborhood Rio Grande station and you'll get exactly the same cracked gasoline that police and emergency car drivers prefer above all others. You'll also get some novel new coins with your change called police money. Boys and girls everywhere are saving this free police money because they can exchange these valuable coins for a complete junior detective outfit. So while you're enjoying police car performance in your car, you're also helping some boy or girl to get 14 free gifts. In the latest issue of the Calling All Cars News, which you can get free from any Rio Grande dealer, you will find a full description of these gifts, together with fascinating illustrated true crime stories and late movie and radio news. Get your free copy of the news right away. All Rio Grande dealers are now recommending Sinclair motor oil. Sinclair not only equals any other oil made, but also has certain features found in no other oil. Before you get your crankcase filled again, Ask your real gun to crack gasoline dealer about Sinclair Motor Oil's advantage. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.